This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 276 was recorded on June 17th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Energy economist Dr. Phil Verlegger debuts as this week's feature interview guest. Our past crude oil specials have focused on oil production, rig and frack spread counts, and comparative inventory. Dr. Verlegger is a formally trained economist, not an oil man, so he'll give us a completely different perspective on the economics of the energy industry, including his views on the coming secular inflation. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview, when Patrick and I will examine the sucker punch the reflation trade just took from the Federal Reserve. So if you're wondering what the heck happened to that beautiful gold rally that looked so promising just a few days ago, stay tuned for the post-game segment when we'll tackle that question in full detail. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, as Eric said, we're dedicating the entire post-game segment to the hawkish Fed surprise. But for the sake of guiding the rest of the market wrap, let's start with a high-level summary before we even dive into the stock market. So, Eric, what the hell just happened? Well, Patrick, the Federal Reserve had one of their famous meetings, and as often happens, there was a knee-jerk response in markets. It seems like a lot of things reversed, and it appears at the first glance as though the inflation trade may be reversing suddenly. I doubt it. I am fading this move, and frankly, I haven't even read the full FOMC statement. The reason is the market tends to freak out on these things. Did they do something like, I don't know, start selling assets to reduce their balance sheet and start cleaning up the mess they've been making for the last decade? No, of course not. All that they did was to kind of allude that maybe they would be a little bit more hawkish and think about raising rates a little bit sooner rather than later. Uh, that's really not that big of a deal, and all of a sudden the world is panicking. If there can be any question left, Patrick, does anybody still believe that this market is not being supported almost entirely by monetary policy? So, you know, what happens with Fed policy, and particularly I think how the political process, especially in the next presidential election cycle, comes back and affects all of that, well, that's going to be really interesting to watch. What matters now, Patrick, is not the viciousness of that knee-jerk move down, but what happens next. It's a question of whether it's just going to all be shrugged off and we move higher tomorrow, or if this is actually going to change the direction of the market. One day is not a new trend. We need to wait and see what happens. Put another way, today was a big so what. The what matters part is what comes next. Either all of these things that suddenly turn down retrace back to the upside or they move to new lows in coming days. That's what we need to keep our eyes on. All right, well, let's touch on that S&P 500 because while the volatility has been in the inner markets on everything, currencies, commodities, and, and bonds, uh, the S&P 500 has not been volatile at all. I mean, we remain uh, pinned in uh, a very tight range going into the quad witching. What's your take on the S&P here? Well, as you say, you know, considering a lot of other parts of the market are freaking out and panicking, the S&P didn't even take out the 34-day moving average. No big deal. So I, I don't think that there's really any reason to think that the rally is in danger. It's probably a viable dip. Now, that doesn't change my opinion that stocks are very badly overvalued here. But so far as I can tell, the, the trend is set to continue. Well, then we definitely have to touch on the dollar index because uh, after almost a month of trading along that 89.90 support of the five-year lows, we have a pretty distinct U.S. dollar uptick. I mean, we are now trading very close to the 92 handle on the dollar index, up almost two full handles since uh, the FOMC. Uh, do you think that's a big turn point in the dollar or is it just noise? 
Well, obviously, it's a, uh, a huge event. The thing is, it's so obviously the most directly related thing to the FOMC, which is what everybody's freaking out about. Uh, is it the same thing? It doesn't matter that we had a knee-jerk move in reaction to FOMC. The question is, does the market shrug it off, or do we push to even higher highs on the dollar index? Uh, that we need to keep paying attention to. It's really going to be the same thing for every asset class almost this week in terms of you know, the big question is, is this all just a, a panic and a knee jerk and it's all going to be shrugged off or is it going to stick? I'm leaning towards it gets shrugged off. All right. Well, let's touch on crude oil because I wanted your take on this. Um, we traded up to $73 around the FOMC meeting period and uh, we uh, reversed. I mean, it's not exactly a crazy reversal, but we're almost back at $70 on the downside here. Uh, what do you take of the little short term reversal on crude? Well, Patrick, just as we predicted here on Macro Voices, we've been in a face-ripping rally. I think that we've been through our consolidation period at the halfway point of the rally. We're now in the second big up leg of the rally. And what I said in my previous predictions was I predicted that by Labor Day, we ought to see a peak price between $80 and $92. Well, Patrick, right now we've come down because of the Fed. But before that, we were almost to 75 and it's only the middle of June. So if anything, I would say the rally has moved uh, further faster than even I expected. And I now start to think about the higher end of my, uh, my target zone toward 90 instead of 80 as being the more likely possibility by the end of summer. Because I think the fundamentals are in place for the rally to continue through the end of the summer. Now, I've also had this overwhelmingly strong hunch that the, there's a reason the demand is going to continue to be strong through the second half of 21. You know something, Patrick, as an engineer, I hate hunches. I like data. I like logical, deductive reasoning. And I haven't been able to put my finger on this. Phil Verlager gave me that light bulb moment in this week's interview. So try to catch it yourself. See if you pick up where the light bulb went off for me in this week's feature interview. In case you miss it, I'll tell you in the postgame segment. The Fed news definitely made a dent. Took us back down to the 13-day moving average. That's a very, very typical technical pattern in the crude oil market. When you get a knee-jerk move, you go to the lowest of the three short-term moving averages. That's the 5, 8, and 13-day moving averages. The lowest one is the 13. That's exactly what got tested today on the, the freak out reaction to the Fed. Uh, I expect we're probably going to trade uh, back up towards $75 within the next week, probably. I don't think this is going to last. If it does last, I don't think it's going to derail the long-term rally. So I added to my long positions in time spreads in the crude oil market this week, and I will continue to add if there is further weakness. All right. Well, we got to touch on gold because, uh, I mean, gold has been for the since April in a beautiful uptrend. It's been holding most consolidations. But in this post-Fed period, we wiped out about $100 to the downside in about 24 hours as we're trading around 1780 at the time of recording here. Uh, do you think this is a major reversal in your mind on gold? I think this is a very typical gold market panic attack, freak out, and buying opportunity. What's going on here is, you know, the, the, the Fed is showing one very small sign of maybe actually exercising a little bit of responsibility and uh, trying to get their balance sheet under control. And people are freaking out. Uh, I have absolute confidence in the uh, Federal Reserve and the people running it to resume their prior pattern of fiscal irresponsibility on an ongoing basis, and that will only help to cause gold to retrace and move much higher. For the moment, though, as it looks like they might actually you know, do their job and act like grown-ups at the Federal Reserve, gold is freaking out because gold is the anti-Federal Reserve. So uh, I, I think this is a buying opportunity. Nothing more, Patrick. So, Eric, we have to talk about the 10-year yield because uh, certainly very volatile in the post-Fed period, almost 10 basis points higher on the first reaction and gave it all back very quickly. Uh, what's your take on the 10-year? Well, you're right, Patrick. We definitely have to talk about the 10-year. But frankly, it, it's too important to cram into the minute and a half that we have here in the market rep. I cheated. I looked ahead at the uh, slide deck. I want to talk to this when we get to your slide. So let's save this conversation for the market rep. This week's feature interview guest is Phil Verlager. Now, Eric, why did we invite Phil on the show this week? I was really looking forward to this one. You know, we've done oil specials before with petroleum geologists and people who are expert in oil production and so forth. Phil is an economist, but he's an economist who has focused 
on energy and oil markets for like 50 years. And he writes what are probably some of the most respected research reports on oil economics anywhere. So he's a super highly respected guy. I've been looking forward to getting him on the show because what I noticed the last time we had Art Berman on, the reason I think I disagreed a little bit with Art is he was driving his price outlook primarily by those oil fundamentals, things like comparative inventory that have been very reliable in the past. I think this is a macroeconomic inflation-driven rally as much as it is a resumption of demand-driven rally. And so I really wanted to talk to an oil guy who's also a macroeconomics guy. You can't do better than Phil Verlegger in terms of that. Eric's interview with Phil is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies. In addition to sponsoring Macro Voices, Abex also produces Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that airs every Saturday morning on all the major podcast platforms. Smarter Markets brings together the leading minds in macroeconomics, technology, and commodities to explore how capital markets can be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Michelle Dennity's five-part series about the role of digital innovation in advancing the ESG economy is live now at smartermarketspod.com and you can look for another terrific interview every Saturday morning. But you won't get Smarter Markets on your Macro Voices feed. You have to subscribe separately to Smarter Markets in your podcast app in order to listen to this free podcast. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Phil Verlager, founder of PK Verlager LLC and also editor and author of Notes at the Margin. Phil, I've really been looking forward to getting you on the show because you have been analyzing the oil business literally for 50, 5 zero years. So you're a veteran of this business. Let's start with the really big picture of, hey, there are people telling us that this entire industry is going away. There are people that have been saying for decades, of course, there's problems with fossil fuels. But now we've actually gotten to the point where the IEA, the International Energy Association, which is supposed to be our own industry body to promote this industry, is telling the world that the entire industry needs to forever stop looking for new oil. Just keep the wells we've got, and then we're going to shut. I guess the idea is a suicide, shut down the entire industry and make it go away in favor of something else. I do think, Phil, we've got to get eventually off of fossil fuels, but I don't think it's going to go down the way a lot of people seem to be talking. How do you assess this? Is the, the industry really coming to a slow motion end, or, or what's happening here? No. the industry. Well, the industry is probably past its peak. I don't think we will see oil consumption ever get back to the levels we saw, say, in 2019. The International Energy Agency is an intergovernmental organization that Henry Kissinger formed. And I, actually, I was working at the Council of Economic Advisors under Jerry Ford when it was formed. So it was designed to deal with energy shocks. And what, what they have done is been following the oil market and energy markets uh, for 50 years. They came out with this net zero 2050 forecast. I don't know why. Uh, and I've done a lot of forecasts. And you know, one of the things I was taught when I started uh, looking at economics after doing my economics degree was if you're going to forecast, forecast often. Well, this is, this is just kind of a one-time forecast, which is a mistake. The other thing we always teach students is never put a number in the, and, and a uh, date on the same piece of paper. And they really blew it here. Now, if you read through it in the back, they also have a, a scenario where we get to net zero maybe by 20, uh, 2100, uh, which is probably more likely. But it's a disconcerting projection. It has knocked people off. Uh, it has really affected industry. I think it's going to make it harder to raise capital when capital is going to be needed. And it's, it's just wrong. Oil use is going to go down. It won't go down as rapidly as they think it will. The economic assumptions they have in it are probably wrong uh, because you can't forecast out 30 years with any accuracy. And uh, there's probably going to be a good deal more carbon capture because as 
if oil prices keep going up as they are right now, it will become more and more profitable to sequester oil the way Occidental Petroleum wants to do in the ground, as we've been doing with, with enhanced oil recovery for as long as I've been around. And so what the IEA said is a distraction, I guess is the way I say it, a real distraction. Let's talk then about what should happen and what's likely to happen, because the way I see this, Phil, is there's so much pressure and, and I think it's it's very counterproductive, frankly. ESG is a good thing in the sense of making the world a better place, you know, environment. We only got one planet. We got to take care of it. I'm all for that. But punishing extractive industries and disfavoring them and treating them as bad guys just because they're involved in doing something, which really is the only known way of meeting the, the planet's energy needs right now until we, you know, come up with better ways, with, with, with newer ways of doing it. Um, it seems to me, at least my prediction of what's going to happen here, is we're disfavoring investment in this industry so much because of the ESG pressure that I think what eventually happens is we get to a crunch. Yes, the industry is slowly, very slowly going away. Fossil fuels are being replaced slowly. But what is happening much more quickly is decline of existing productive assets that are not being replaced with new production because the investment didn't happen. So where a lot of people see a price crash at the end of oil, I think the final price crunch to the final all-time high actually comes as the industry is winding down in the grand scheme of things because the investment's not there. And that's very much non-consensus. What do you think? Am I onto something or am I crazy to think that? Your scenario is more realistic than the scenario that's been put forward by the IEA. Well, that's not saying Start much. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> no, it's, 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 again, I think you're on, on to something. What is going to happen is investment by companies that are domiciled in the, in the EU, in the United States, and Canada that is going to stop. Uh, the arrival of Gary Gensler at the SEC is going to put a lot of pressure on companies listed on, on U.S. stock exchange. And having spent some time with Gensler during the uh, Obama administration when he was running the CFTC, uh, he is a very tough uh, hombre and probably as the best chairman of the SEC since Arthur Levitt. So, I mean, he's going to make these companies disclose and, and investors are going to move away. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that Equinor in Norway isn't going to keep investing. Saudi Arabia will invest. The Russians will invest some. And so that there will be oil production. And, you know, that if you come back to your scenario, so we're going to be importing more and more oil uh, or a higher percentage of the oil we're, uh, we're using. And uh, those countries will have more and more monopoly power and they'll try to use it. The one question in this whole scenario is China. China sits out there, and, and if they decide they want to put, depress commodity prices, they have the power to do it. They're, they've just done it with copper and some uh, aluminum. So it's, yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the, that as, and those countries are going to look and say, well, we've got one last chance to get some money, and they'll try to do it. Now, the risk is as the U.S. companies die and the European companies die, and, I, and let me be clear, BP and Shell and Total are not going to become new energy companies. Economic history shows that companies like Kodak that are really good in film die. So what will happen is the consuming countries will have less and less of an incentive to, to use oil because their companies at home aren't using it. So that will then mean that the, uh, there's an accelerated pressure to get off oil. But yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, the price of oil is going to is likely to go up as we get off oil. Phil, we usually focus on macroeconomic subjects here on Macro Voices, such as secular inflation. And I'm very much convinced that we're at the beginning of what I think could be an epic secular inflation. So as I prepare for an interview with you, I go, oh, got to get out of macro mode into energy mode. I look at your newsletter. What's the first thing you're writing about? It's inflation. So it's, I think, great minds think alike. Tell me your view. Why are you got inflation on your mind? I think we're potentially looking at a major secular event over the next decade. Is that what you're thinking about? Or are you just thinking about a whiff of inflation here? I'm worried about a major secular inflation. Now, I'm an economist. I, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time focused on oil, but I, I, you know, I started out working at Data Resources, which was the first time-sharing 
economic forecasting firm. And uh, it was in 1971. Well, so I lived through the uh, inflation of the 70s. I spent four years at the U.S. Treasury working for the Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and uh, the Secretary of Treasury when Paul Volcker came in. And, and, and so you know, I have seen inflation. And, you know, if you if you want to understand oil, you want to understand any commodity, you have to start by understanding the economy. So, you know, I pulled off my shelf a, a 1982 book by Barry Bosworth and Bob Lawrence called Commodity Prices and the New Inflation. And it was published by Brookings. And it looked at the 70s and, you know, and they go back to the 60s, late 60s. What happened then? People didn't invest in the capacity to make copper. They didn't make an, invest in the capacity to make steel and so on. And uh, guess what? We had commodity shortages and we had a commodity price run up. Uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And so you know, I, I started looking at that. Then, the, then to add to that, uh, there is a, a paper by Andrew Haldane, who is the chief economist at the Bank of England, and a very smart economist and everything. And, and he laid out a, a case for more inflation because, one, the labor force seems to be down. We don't know why, but the number, I mean, you, you talk about macro view, views, the, the number of workers coming back, we're short. And what's happening? Well, people are trying to offer bonuses to get people to come back to restaurants. In Pittsburgh, they found a great solution. They paid, started paying restaurant workers $15 an hour. They got plenty of people. So we're going to get away. We're going to get some wage push inflation, and you take that and and you start adding that. You got shortage shortages, a lumber shortage. The lumber prices have come down, but they're still seventy, eighty percent above a year ago. You look at other uh, at copper and so on, and then you have this ESG, all the all, using all this copper and so on in in the in electric cars and so on and the chips. We have a problem, and yes, inflation is going to be a problem unless the Fed uh, Fed raises rates. And squeezes the economy the way uh, uh, Volcker did in in uh, 1981. Guess what? We have inflation, and uh, it, it's going to be around for a while. Phil, the thing that really concerns me about this coming secular inflation, and frankly, this is my biggest concern about all financial markets. I don't think there's any replacement for experience in any field. And frankly, the number of guys, Phil, like yourself, who were working in this business as adults in the late 1960s and remember the onset of secular inflation and everybody saying it's tra it's transitory, don't worry about it. Maybe back then they called it transient because they hadn't invented transitory <laughs> yet. I'm not sure. But, you know, it was no big deal and nobody's worried. And then come the 1970s and <laughs> guess what? It's a big deal. Um, I don't think that the number of people that are still working in the industry who were working in the industry in the late 1960s when you would need to in order to have that experience, I don't think that, that number of people is more than a couple hundred guys. What could go wrong here? Because you've been through this when back in the 60s, nobody had seen inflation for 50 years. What happens when a secular inflation that, and you clearly got the backdrop right now, CNBC and Bloomberg, they tell us it's transitory. Just listen to Janet Yellen. Everything's fine. What could go wrong, Phil, if it turns out, number one, that it's not transitory, but number two, that Every single one of the professional oil traders in the universe was in diapers the last time this happened and has never been through it and doesn't know what to make of it. Well, it's not just oil traders. It's, you know, I said it's, the whole every, financial world. The whole, the whole financial. It's just, all these guys. And a lot of, I mean, a lot of them weren't even around. Uh, you know, their parents were in grade school. You know, it's disconcerting. Uh, Jeffrey Garten's got a great book that's coming out, Three Days at Camp David. And I'll give him a plug because I have a piece in the international economy that looks at it. August 15th, 1971, this August, be 50 years. President Nixon took people up there. He took uh, George Schultz. He took the uh, Secretary of Treasury, John Connolly, took Pete Peterson, a few others up. And on the Sunday, August 15th, he uh, announced a price freeze, 90-day price freeze. And he also broke the connection between the dollar and gold. And I think it was very important. I spent a number of years at the Peterson Institute for International Economics because had we not done that, we would have had a run on the dollar. We would probably have had a major recession because you have to defend the dollar. And you have you know, all the kind of effects that my teacher, Charlie Kindleberger, talked about in his books, A Man is Panic and Crises, and his other books on economic history. So that's a hugely important event. 
One of the outcomes of that event was uh, price controls on oil, which they kept and stayed and became worse and more pernicious and caused all sorts of distortions. And one of the reasons that the energy sector gets treated badly in policy sites, the IEA, same thing, is nobody with experience in energy is allowed to be an energy policy maker. Uh, one little anecdote, Claude Brenniger was the Secretary of Transportation to Richard Nixon. He'd been an executive vice president at Unical. So Nixon brought him in. He was there in 71, 73, when the price was came. But they'd very carefully said, you can't do anything on energy because nobody with energy or nobody from the big, bad oil industry can, can affect oil policy in the government. And so he joked, because he and I and several people at Treasury, I think Mike Blumenthal, who was the secretary, met at the time. And when we were trying to get decontrol, Treasury in 79 really wanted decontrol of oil and get out of these Nixon, Ford, Carter programs to defend the dollar. And Brenniger just joked that when he was in the cabinet meeting, after the Young Hipper War, he was the only member of the cabinet who knew that there were 42 gallons in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the state of knowledge of energy policy officials. I've just done, I'm going to use it someplace, a table that looks at the background of energy secretaries versus treasury secretaries. And what you see is in the case of treasury, you have people like Paulson, Henry Paulson, he had it Goldman Sachs. He knew about financial markets. He knew how all these things came. So when you had a crisis in 2008, he brought all the bankers in and he said, you're all taking TARP money because we don't want to identify which banks are bad. And they all did. We have nothing like that in energy. It has never happened. We come back to this, uh, the IEA forecast. Well, the chief, head of the IEA was the chief economist at OPEC before there. Uh, he has no experience in the thing. Our, our, none of our energy secretaries. Uh, Ernie Moniz was is a great nuclear physicist. He was really help, helpful in the Iran negotiations and the Obama administration. But he's not an experienced in the energy side. He's gone to a lot of meetings. And the energy industry, and you come comes back to your point, is treated and particularly oil, uh, like a stepchild. You know, we don't want, you know, we want academics or something like that to figure out oil policy without knowing anything about it. And guess what? We get all the disasters we keep getting. Phil, it really is amazing the way politicians just have no idea what's going on. The one that you mentioned, you know, not knowing how many gallons are in a barrel of oil. The one that, that is striking to me is the inability of politicians to have any cognizance that all crude oil is not fungible and created equal. Light, sour, and heavy sweet are two different things. You, you can't, be, because we have lots of one in the Bakken doesn't mean we don't need any more of the other from the Middle East. And that concept is just too hard for Maxine Waters to process, no matter what you do. And I, I don't know how we, <laughs> we move on beyond that. It's really an interesting world that we live in. Something I've noticed, though, you know, you'd think is, okay, supposedly the petroleum industry, if not the whole energy industry is supposed to come to an end. You'd think that what I'd be hearing in pitches I'm getting in terms of, you know, investing in energy would be alternatives, the, the wind, the solar, the photo photovoltaics, all that stuff. I just listened to a pitch this morning for yet another carbon credit company. And what I'm noticing is as the petroleum industry at least starts to wind down, it seems like both the carbon sequestration, but more so the carbon credits are where the money is. So, what do you make of this? And where is it all headed? Well, okay. You put a great point in there. I'd like, I'd like to, for just a second, go back. You're talking about light, sweet, crude, and then I'll go to the carbon credit. So when you ended, ended it with Maxine Waters and light, sweet, crude, that caused a major part of the 2008 recession. And nobody understands it. And it points to this, it points to this very issue. Because what happened was in 19... In, sorry, not 19. In 2005, 2006, we started switching to ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. The re industry didn't have enough refining capacity, and the Europe Europeans just barged ahead and did the same thing. So, what happened is in 2008, when crude got to $130 a barrel, the refiners were all looking for light, sweet crude, and they couldn't find it, and diesel prices were pulling crude up and up and up. Meantime, heavy crude, the Iranians had heavy crude sit sitting on ships and they were trying to sell it. And nobody buy it. So, I mean, the failure to understand this had contributed maybe half a percent, maybe a percentage point to the GDP decline in 2008. Mostly it was housing, but it was there. Now, 
let me go to the, in terms of carbon credit, you know, I, I left teaching at Yale and went uh, to Drexel Burnham and helped create the NYMEX contract in 1983, NYMEX crude contract. They had the heating oil contract. I think that this carbon trading is going to become a very big deal because the only way the world gets towards net zero in 2050, it's not going to get there, but it gets towards there, is with good sequestration. Now, Occidental talks about putting in the ground. That works. Planting trees is not a, you know, you know that, that's a Ponzi scheme. But if you have devices that are, can take carbon out of the air or other ways, as Exxon is talking about on the ship channel, that actually gets CO2 out and it puts it in the ground and I can make a blockchain. And so you, you can sell it just the way you sell other things like Bitcoin on a blockchain. And that's meaningful. It's expen- right now it's expensive. If they do more of it, I think they'll bring the cost down. And so that comes back to saying, well, yeah, there are going to be all these different proposals to trade carbon. A lot of them are going to be Ponzi schemes. A few of them are really going to work. And the few that really work are going to take off. Uh, somebody from VTOL said yesterday, I think at the FT conference, that they think that the carbon trading market will become bigger than the oil market. And, that, and the oil market's huge. So now if that's the case, what happens is you've got a price of carbon, then it, and I can buy carbon credits or I can sell carbon credits. And that, that then facilitates, that's the market facilitating the transition to net zero rather than somebody in Paris uh, at the IEA saying, this is how you have to do it. You know, it, it's a market system rather than the old Soviet command and control system. And we've seen the market system work since August 1571. Reuters got invented after that. And we started getting the Reuters machines so we could trade currencies. It's going to be the same type of adjustment. And I think it'll come pretty quickly. Now, Phil, you focus almost entirely on the petroleum industry, yet people who read notes at the margin are reading about China selling metals. What do metals have to do with the petroleum industry, and is why, why is China selling them so interesting? Well, the first thing you can say is the price of a commodity, you're trying to forecast the price of a commodity is very difficult because the price of elasticity of demand is low, price elasticity of supply is low, so you can have an equilibrium price in case of oil anyway, place from 30 to 50 to 80 to 90 dollars. Then when you add inventories, the problem becomes intractable because if there are significant inventories of a commodity and traders choose to buy more for storage, they push the price up a lot, call it hoarding. If traders choose to unload their stocks, uh, the prices come way down in the liquidation. And government stockpiles are the biggest uh, uh, random variable in this whole thing. The Chinese have a metal stockpile. And if they start choosing to put some of the copper back on the market, they can send the price down a lot. And they've already have. Uh, There were rumors they were going to do this. They have huge oil inventories. They have over a billion barrels of oil. And it's, you know, they, they have more oil inventories relative to consumption than the United States does. If they decide that the price is too high and the Chinese are really worried about inflation, they can start, A, telling people not to drive so much, but B, telling companies to use oil inventories or selling oil from their strategic stocks instead of buying it from OPEC. And that can, that can alter the global supply-demand uh, balance a lot for quite a while. So, I mean, it is a big deal, and the Chinese are much more willing to intervene in the market to get their way than the United States has been. Phil, a lot of people are saying that, hey, it's all going to change in any day now. They're going to lift the sanctions on Iran and it changes everything and the price goes shooting right back down to, I don't know what the number is because I don't agree with them. But at the same time, I don't hear anybody really talking about the fact that, you know, a lot of Iranian oil really never came off the market. There's gray market leakage of that oil no matter what. How big of a deal is this really, Phil? I mean, people are acting like it's a big deal. But when it happens, when they say, okay, you know, the Biden administration has uh, come to new terms, they've reinitiated the nuclear deal with Iran, and there's no more sanctions on Iranian oil. Is that a huge price shock that changes everything? Or is that more of a, you know, already priced in, been there, done that, let's move on? It all depends on what Saudi Arabia does. And it's, it's not production. It's how much oil Saudi Arabia sells into the market. They were willing to take an extra million barrels a day off the market 
I forget exactly when, I think about just about the beginning of the year. And that really firmed up the market. Prince Abdulaziz is the most educated in economics of any of the Saudi oil ministers. And he has his, I, I'm a finger on the, uh, on the pulse of this thing. You know, back uh, in 2019, when there was the, the attacks on the Saudi oil facilities, I thought you were going to see a big jump in the price. Well, the Saudis went and bought oil from Iraq to sell to their customers to make sure the price didn't jump. I mean, you know, one of the things he talks about is how, uh, how Greenspan dealt with a, with a stock market drop in the 80s. So I think, you know, the reentry of Iran, one, the volume won't come out as quickly, and two, the Saudis will, will try to adjust, as will other country, other producers. I mean, the, the more interesting indicator is what's happening with the UAE, because they're pushing this futures market, and they're really going to a, to a totally market-oriented deal rather than, you know, they've taken off their destination limits on where crude goes and so on. So they're, you know, they're really doing what the, what the NYMEX did to crude in, 19, uh, in you know, 1983. So I think that uh, the, the Iraqis can't push a lot of oil out, although they evidently have maybe 60 million barrels of oil on, in storage they can sell. And I think it, it's less of an event because people will react to, a, to balance it. So I'm not, I, I'm not as convinced that it's a big deal. And I, I think the, Iraq, the Iranians also have a habit of, of messing up some of these things just when the opportunity is right uh, coming to them. Phil, I'm hoping that you can fill me in because, frankly, there is a big piece of this energy future story that doesn't add up for me. I hear the ESG story of, hey, fossil fuels, problem, carbon, I get it. we got to solve that problem. Okay, I would think a logical, rational person would say, therefore, the way we're going to get more energy is we're going to do this, this, and this. And of course, there are discussions that are going on, and there, there's activity going on in photovoltaics, in, in uh, you know wind farms, and so forth. But frankly, it pales in contrast to the amount of energy production that would be necessary to actually replace fossil fuels. So I, I get this whole essentially the whole world government seems to be behind this idea of we got to get rid of fossil fuels. We, we all seem to agree on that. Carbon is the enemy. But nobody seems that interested to me in finding viable alternatives. We know that windmills don't work when the wind's not blowing. We know that photovoltaic solar cells don't work at night. Now, we do know that nuclear could be the solution, but there's a huge political opposition to nuclear. I think we need a nuclear renaissance. A lot of, you know, it's very hard to sell that. Uh, I talked to my friend Robert Friedland, who's very involved in this geothermal thing. He's saying if we could just get a breakthrough to a new level of geothermal drilling technology to where we drill deeper into hotter rock than we know how to drill into now, we could solve the energy problems of the whole world forever. I don't hear very many people talking about realistic solutions such as deep geothermal or non-uranium-fueled nuclear, things that I think about. Nobody seems to focus on that, but they're very focused on getting rid of the carbon. Am I missing something, Phil, or is nobody actually looking for the solution that replaces the petroleum when it's gone? People are looking all sorts of places. Uh, but... but the focus of the investment industry is not, as far as I can see, on the hot prospects. That's well, not the focus of the investment industry is not on the hot prospects. Uh, we're not training the people. I mean, take the geothermal th example. That's a you know, I hadn't heard of that. It's a great idea. Uh, it would take a lot of engineers. Look at the engineering schools, they're turning out software engineers, they're not turning out uh, petroleum engineers who might who could easily do that kind of drilling. We're not investing there. Turn to um, the nuclear industry, I think you know nuclear does need a restart, and it, Bill Gates has said it's a great idea. I think he's right. You ought to invest in it, and so on. Uh, nuclear engineering is the toughest engineering course in a, co a college. Uh, electrical engineering is hard. Chemical engineering is very hard. Nuclear is really hard. There aren't many. We're not training nuclear engineers. They've closed down the engineering nuclear engineering departments at, at many colleges. Okay. So how do you go to a nuclear engineering business if you don't have the nuclear engineers? The answer is you don't. 
China is, is turning out a number of nuclear engineers, but now it turns out they have some problems with their technologies. And it takes years and years to build a nuclear plant. I mean, it, you know, if you look at the, uh, the Georgia Power one, it's, I think it's 10 years behind. So yeah, nuclear, doesn't, nuclear is out. Geothermal, it's a great idea. We need the engineers. We don't, you know, we don't have the people to do this. And everybody misses this. And so yeah, I, I'm with you. I don't know how we get there. And you come back to the oil industry. Well, the oil industry is, we're going to need it. But the trouble is, there aren't many people left. I mean, they're, you know, most, when I talk to, uh, to younger students, you talk about when I was teaching in Calgary, uh, do you want to go into the petroleum industry? No, these are 30 year old, 25 year old people, engineering degrees, because the engineer is such a, uh, a cyclical business. You take a job, they pay you a lot, but then suddenly you're like, you're fired. You, you look at what happened in, after uh, 2014. Uh, so the industry has eaten its own children. Uh, and it, I'm not sure it's got the manpower, to, man and women power to keep going ahead. So, uh, you know, we got a big, big problem. That comes back to your original question, inflation. If we don't have the capacity to add, you get more inflation. See, this is the part of this, Phil, which concerns me the most and which I think most people don't get is it's about the natural resources of intellectual capital more than anything else. It might be possible to use thorium rather than uranium to have a nuclear renaissance that completely solves all of the energy problems for the world. If that happens, it's most likely to be a Chinese company that does it because that's where they've got the engineering talent. And Robert Friedland might be right that, that you could get to deep geothermal and solve all the energy problems of the whole world that way. But it's not going to be U.S. engineers that have this problem. Meanwhile, in the country that I was born in, we have the very best social media engineers that create Facebook for us. <laughs> yeah. And you yeah. know what? That is making way more money in the short term than you'd ever make being in the energy business. But I think it ultimately, long term, is going to put the country at a huge disadvantage and change our standing in the world completely because we lost the engineering talent that we used to have in the United States. And um, it's... I, can't, I, you know, I can't agree with you more. I mean, it's, I want you to disagree uh, with me. I really badly well, no, do. But, but so I, rem I grew up in California in a town that's uh, La Cunata that's right next to JPL. And I remember when Sputnik went up. I think I was eight or nine or ten. And suddenly, you know, I, I was really good at math and I could read, but I couldn't spell. Suddenly, the fact that I couldn't spell didn't make any difference because I was good in math. Everybody, they wanted engineers. and every, I mean, the push to get engineers and the push to get mathematicians and science people was just enormous. And it led all the way through to when I, uh, when I went to MIT to get my PhD. I mean, you know, there was a focus. We need these people engineers we need chemical engineers we need aeronautical engineers we need electrical engineers we need nuclear engineers and then suddenly we stopped building the nuclear power plants so if you so i have a nephew who's a uh, has a nuclear engineering degree what's he doing he's working at goldman sachs trading writing programs to, to to calculate option values i mean we diverted all our talent to financial engineering and we're going to pay for it Unfortunately, I'm afraid that we're in violent agreement on that point. <laughs> Phil, I want to move on, though, because uh, the oil traders in the audience will kill me if uh, I had you on the show and I never even asked you for your outlook for the market. So we've been talking about a high level, big picture. Where do we go over the next 20 years? Uh, let's talk about the, the next year or two. What do you see on the horizon? Because with your inflation outlook, uh, maybe you're super bullish, but I know you've also had reason to concern that this market may have gone too far too fast. So how do you see this? So, you know, you read everybody's forecasts and, and I, I contribute to a, a British consensus economics thing. But, you know, I have long since moved past modeling to try to think about prices. And what I do is I, I, I rely on, uh, on the decision of investors. Particularly, I watch the share price of the BP Royalty Trust. Because if you buy shares in it, what you're doing is you're buying a cash flow tied to the price of WTI. That's all you get. It dies eventually uh, when the costs that they factored into the, uh, the unit back in 1989 
exceed the uh, the uh, the uh, price for two years, and it looked like it was going to go away, and now it's and suddenly it's come, bounced back, and so it looks you know it looks to me like investors and most people uh, see kind of the price edging upwards slowly, you know maybe at about a twelve percent per year rate uh, from the current levels. That says you know we we're at seventy seventy two seventy three for the rest of the year. And it, it goes up further from there. And I can't argue with that. I think the, the OPEC plus ministers are working really hard to keep kind of keep prices going up. It helps the Saudi economy. And it helps the Middle Eastern economies, helps the Russian economy. And uh, so that unless, uh, you know, if it gets too far, I think China will come in and dump some of the uh, their huge inventory on the market to, to keep the price from, say, going past, say, 80 you know, it's, it's, it'll hold in this range for some time to come, particularly with the uh, demands of investors that companies like uh, Pioneer and others increase their, their dividends to shareholders and, and this recent shareholder revolt of Exxon. So I, I find it hard to find a way really going steeply down unless, unless the Fed and, uh, or somebody else uh, throws a monkey wrench into the economy. Phil, I want to ask you about finished product demand because Goldman Sachs uh, made big waves a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think, saying, okay, 5.2 million barrels of additional demand coming on the market, baby. Here we go. Demand's coming back. Vaccines are out. Let's do it. Well, Phil, I'm looking at my my crude oil going through the roof and I'm looking at my Arbob gasoline on the bottom of its trading range, barely struggling to stay alive. And I'm thinking... It's not the products that are pushing the the price higher. What's driving this market? Why is the the crude oil market so hot when it seems like gasoline that normally is the driver behind it hasn't been as hot? Well, the crude oil is hot because there's a lot of uh, speculative money coming in. If you follow the CFTC data, as I've been doing since, oh, Lord, uh, the late 90s, we've seen a big push of speculators into it. They have managed to push uh, backwardation up by about two, two and a half dollars a barrel. So they've lifted the whole curve. Gasoline demand hasn't recovered, and gasoline demand is not going to recover, and probably this year and maybe next year for a couple of reasons. One, workers are not rushing back to the office. People will go back to the office, but people figured out how to do things more efficiently. Productivity is up, and one of the ways productivity is up is because people don't go into the office as often as they used to, and they won't. But the other thing about gasoline demand and diesel demand is it's tied to the housing industry. People don't notice this. They always say the summer is the summer driving season. Well, it's not the summer driving season. It's the summer home building and construction business. People build a lot more during the warm months. Well, and they build and, a whole lot more when the pandemic just ended and scared a whole bunch of people out of cities, too. Yeah, well, that's true. But the Housing Start data that came out today show don't show a big jump. Because there's this other problem that we start we talked about at the start of the of the show, the lumber shortage. So housing starts, you know, the cost of lumber has become so large in the construction of house housing that uh, builders are holding back because the buyers aren't buyers can't come up with the money. So uh, if you look at the uh, seasonally unadjusted data, housing starts are about where they were at this time, 2019. So that that says okay. You're not getting this big incremental push from the, from the construction business. You're getting some from the travel business, but not as much as you, it doesn't matter as much. And people aren't going back to work. So we're 9% down, I think, in gasoline demand in terms of the actual way, not the way DOE measures it, but, but taxable gasoline demand. Electric cars may be cutting it a little bit, but not much yet. The same thing's true in Europe. In India, demand is, uh, of, uh, motor fuel demand is, is down about 15 to 20 percent from 2019 levels because COVID is still strong there. So, you know, product demand is going to come back, but I don't I don't see the number that Goldman Sachs comes up with. Well, Phil, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Before I let you go, though, I want to talk to you about notes on the margin. And for our listeners, we've got a treat for you this week, folks. Be sure to check your Research Roundup email, and you'll find a download link for several complimentary issues of Phil's newsletter, Notes on the Margin, which I quite enjoy reading. So I strongly encourage you to check that out. Phil, tell us a little bit about what people can expect to find inside Notes at the Margin when they get there. And for those who are interested in subscribing, how do they contact you? Well, I call it a report rather than a newsletter because it's, newsletters are kind of newsy. 
newsletters don't have footnotes, and kind of I run to about twenty footnotes an issue. This is an economic. It's an economic report, and I'm just trying to think about the economic issues. I, I created it years ago at the request of several people because I keep talking about economics, and they say, "Would you would you write it out?" And that's what I do. And it's it's an economic focus. It's it's almost geeky economics. I try to keep the modern stuff out because sometimes I don't even under, under, fully understand the modern. But I mean, it is laying. You know, I try to integrate what we know from the economic frontier into the energy markets. And I guess I'm influenced a lot by uh, Jillian Tett, who is the editor, uh, an editor at, at the Financial Times, who wrote The Silo Effect. She's an anthropologist and how we all live in the kind of our individual silos. And I, and I try to get out and, I, and look at the economics and energy. So it's looking at the economics and it's, you know, I rarely stick a forecast in because, you know, everybody's got forecasts. What I have that I bring to this uniquely is the kind of a connection to the inflation and the potential for an economic slowdown if the Fed moves and what that does to energy. You know, it's, it's trying to look at the whole body. As far as getting in touch with us, we have a webpage. It's www.pkverlegerllc.com. That's P-K-V-E-R-L-E-G-E-R-L-L-C.com. There's a spot on that to contact us. And uh, my editor, Kim Peterson, who's down in uh, Key West, Florida, picks all that up and responds or sends things to us. And it, it's most of the uh, uh, this is aimed for major, larger oil companies or larger energy companies or banks that have big concerns about the energy sector and are trying to look kind of past the day to day events and kind of look forward to kind of what the big trends are. So, you know, I, I take on things like this. Uh, EA forecast of net zero and try to say, here's where, here's where the big problems are. Well, Phil, we look forward to getting you back on the show in a few months for another update. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Escrow.com is the payment system for buying and selling anything of value. Cars, boats, airplanes, jewelry, gemstones, fine art, collectibles, intellectual property rights, domain names, bringing in shipping containers from overseas, or even buying and selling entire businesses. It's simple to use. Either party sets up the transaction, then the buyer sends the funds to escrow.com. The seller is then instructed to send the goods to the buyer to inspect. Within the inspection period, the buyer can return the items for any reason. After that, Escrow.com pays the seller immediately. Escrow.com is the world's most secure payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Over 2 million customers have transacted over $5 billion on escrow.com. And eBay and Shopify use it for cars, boats, luxury watches, and business sales. It's available in the United States, Canada, and Australian dollars, euros, and British pounds. Never buy or sell anything online unless you use escrow.com. Escrow.com is a subsidiary of freelancer.com. Listed on the OTCQX best markets under the ticker symbol FLNCF, and the Australian Securities Exchange under the ticker FLN. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Phil on the show. You know, I actually really enjoyed the interview. It was really a great high-level view of how the energy markets are going to evolve. But now uh, you've been saving your little epiphany of what you uh, took away from the interview. Uh, why don't you share it with us? Patrick, I've had this just nagging feeling that uh, there's going to be really strong continuing demand through the rest of this year. And I don't like nagging feelings. I like data and facts. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And what suddenly clicked for me was when Phil Verlegger said, okay, what's going on is everybody thinks the way that summer market works is about summer driving season. That's summer driving season in air quotes, most famously spoken words of every oil analyst. What Phil is saying is it doesn't really work that way. It's the summer home construction season, which is using up the diesel and the various other products. And that's the reason that we have all this extra demand between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Well, 
guess what? Uh, every single home builder that I have ever heard of, and I have tried to contact some around a project uh, on my vacation home, tell me that everybody's booked for like two years. There's absolutely impossible to hire anybody or to get building materials because everything is in short supply. I think that home construction is the secret stealth zombie fundamental driver that is really going to make Goldman Sachs actually proven right against what everybody else thinks in terms of what happens with demand in the oil market. Now, ironically, I get this insight from Phil, who doesn't agree with Goldman Sachs, but I think that that home construction trend is going to use more energy than any analyst is really figuring into their equations. And I think demand is going to be stronger than expected. And it really, to me, provides an explanation for this feeling that I've been having about why I'm extremely bullish. And also, it explains why the tape action has been so incredibly strong, stronger than even I expected. And I've been super bullish. That was long-winded, Patrick. Let's move into the chart deck. Did the Fed kill the reflation trade? Listeners, you'll find the download link to the chart deck in your research roundup email. Now, if you don't have a research roundup email, don't feel left out. Just go to our macrovoices.com homepage and click on the red button that says looking for the downloads. We'll get you signed up and send you the links. Patrick, before we get to the S&P 500, let's talk about the reflation trade in a little more detail than uh, we had time for in the market wrap. Right. And so I just really wanted to comment on one thing in, in the market wrap that you said, which is actually so true, which is that one day does not make a new trend. And watching how the market develops here in the next week or two has is, in my mind, incredibly critical. And so this chart deck that we put together here, it's really just looking at the first 24 hours in the post-Fed period and the trend moves that have broken and the things that have to be watched in the coming week that are going to show the hand as to whether, in fact, the reflation trade has reversed or whether it was just noise. And so let's dive into it. The first thing that I wanted to touch on is the S&P 500 on page two. Out of all of the uh, global macro markets, it's the S&P 500 that actually made the smallest and most muted reaction. For me, though, I don't think that that is something that traders and, and investors should overread into. We are going into a quad witching expiration on Friday and and the gamma pin is uh, is as big as it as it gets, and uh, the S and P 500 staying within a 50 point range into Friday's close, even on a surprise announcement from the Fed, was uh, was the base case. And though that we're going to end the week probably in a very tight range, what will be the real question next week is when when volatility does return, and it will return, is it going to be a, a sort of a delayed reaction to this idea that there's a Fed tightening. On balance, I mean, look, the market could go either way, but it is more vulnerable to the downside on this. And I wouldn't expect it today or tomorrow in order to make that reaction. So uh, Monday, Tuesday, by the time, then definitely by the time we're recording next week's Macro Voices interview, I think there's going to be a lot of really important information in terms of whether or not the downside volatility actually kicks in. The interesting part about this reflation trade passing out in terms of, uh, or potentially rolling rolling over is the idea that maybe the FANG stocks actually finally turn back up. And those are the large behemoth names in, in the index. And while we could end up seeing selling in everything from financials to cyclicals, the interesting storyline will be, can the index remain more muted on the idea that maybe we see uh, rotation and rotation back out of the cyclicals and into these kind of growth fang stocks that play a very defensive role in a period where we have a, some sort of disinflationary surge. And uh, that's 100% the thing to watch next week. Patrick, I could not possibly agree more. Next week is is what we need to watch. What happens on a quad witching day tomorrow is not really uh, going to tell us where this market is headed next. Well, Patrick, as we review the various different asset classes that we cover in the market wrap with the benefit of charts, I think you've already covered the uh, S&P 500. Let's move on to page three and the U.S. dollar index. Boy, look at those two green candles. Is that uh, the beginning of something or is it just uh, maybe a little false alarm? 
Again, one day doesn't make a new trend. So we don't want to commit to a, a massive trend reversal just to 24 hours after the Fed announcement. But the uh, one thing that we know is that there was a major support line, that five-year support line that we've talked about week after week on the show uh, that held. And uh, typically after a support line holds, there's typically some Fibonacci style retracement or some mean reverting correction that happens the other way. A punch up to this 92 level is actually a very natural reaction action, what really is going to be the tell is whether or not the bulls can hold these gains. I mean, if we find ourselves by the end of next week back down to under 91 and heading down toward 90 again, and it was just one big fake out, then the, nothing has changed in the bigger dollar view that we had. And so really, uh, after a big move like this, it's really about whether this has shifted the buying and, and money flow and capital flows and whether the US dollar under a, a more hawkish Fed could potentially start to see a strengthening. And certainly um, the, the breakdown in the euro was a big tell. And with the yen almost pressing, the US dollar yen almost pressing north of 111, the dollar trend could emerge. And so that's uh, 100% something that uh, has to be watched into next week. Patrick, let's move on to the Bloomberg Commodity Index chart. Boy, look at that big gap. Right. And instead of going into a lot of the individual commodities, I wanted to just show the bigger commodity index because we've seen massive turns in lumber. All the grains have rolled over. Copper has broken down through uh, short-term retracement levels. Uh, we actually see an incredibly broad break on the downside in commodities. The only commodity that's held up is crude oil, which is on, on page five. And w even though that has had that one-day reversal candle, but that's actually what's held because of the weighting in the commodity index. That's what actually has held this chart up pretty well. And uh, the fact that the commodity index has broken those May lows and has really rolled over without oil contributing to the selling is a red flag. Again, one day doesn't make a new trend. And, uh, and the best thing that could happen for the bulls is a quick and rapid reversal where this ends up proving to be a buy on dip and they quickly rally it back to 92, 93, 94 on the upside in the coming week. Uh, if that happens, then that could neutralize it. But this kind of a break is a big red flag, like a canary in the coal mine. We have to see whether that begets more selling and whether the, there's a dynamic and deep retracement of that, uh, that now six-month rally off those November lows. With that said, Eric, let's go and actually look at that crude oil chart on page five. And, uh, and you can see that red reversal candle. It's, a, it's certainly nothing that changes the primary uptrend. There are numerous occasions over the last six months where we've had these two, three, four, five day sell-offs where crude oil pulls back $5. And it, it just, it's just a buying opportunity on the dip that reverses back up and becomes a new trend. And so I, it's far too premature to already be calling a major time top and crude, but at minimum, some sort of a profit-taking cycle or small correction back to some moving averages is entirely on the table. But really, the bigger question I have is that can crude oil buck the trend? If we are seeing a broader turn in the entire commodity complex, can oil just march to the beat of its own drum? I mean, gasoline futures did not confirm with a higher high. There's all sorts of divergences in a number of the other commodity markets. Can crude oil just avoid uh, succumbing to all of that and keep the trend higher? And that's one of the bigger questions I have in my mind. Do you have an opinion on it? Well, I think we should really quantify this around where the different risk scenarios are, Patrick, because there's different ways that this could play out. I think what we both agree on very much is what we see here is very consistent with exactly what you would see if it was a top and a reversal of trend, a very sudden change in a, in a fairly dramatic, you know, downward move, but it hasn't moved very far yet. Uh, that is what a top looks like. If this was the beginning of a topping and, you know, reversal down to $30, or something, it would look exactly like this. You and I both have a pretty strong hunch that that's not what's happening here and that, if anything, the trade is to fade this. Now, I would love to see crude come back down. What are we, 
at 70, spot 13 on this chart. I'd love to see it come back down to 68 to the breakout zone there just to sort of test that breakout zone as support because that just gives the market more strength to move higher. Uh, if I see that further weakness down from 70 down to 69, down to 68, even down to a, a 67 handle, doesn't bother me at all. I look at that as great news for the bulls buying opportunity to add to my positions. Everything's good. Now, if you start getting daily closes below that March high, which was what, around 66 and change, and uh, it stays there for a few days, it really starts to paint another picture. But going back to what you said, Patrick, you said if the reflation trade is already over, frankly, I think you and I agree that the reflation trade probably is not really over. But if the reflation trade is over, which we both don't think it is, well, then, look, this is probably the beginning of a reversal. That probably was the top, and there's probably a whole lot lower to come in oil prices. I don't think it's going to go that way, though. Well, so, Eric, we do have to then touch on gold, right? On page six, I have that gold chart, and what a nasty break that was. I mean, we were overdue for a gold correction after such a run, but it, my first approach to it was that there was a buy on dip whenever whatever gold break we had. But the the velocity to the downside in this post-Fed period is just uh, is mind-boggling. I mean, the, the fact that we wiped out this much this quickly, it makes uh, buying the dip a little more challenging. The big question really is, is in this kind of uh, 1775 to 1800 level, can the bulls hold it in along this line? Because uh, in order for a bull trend to really be in play, you should see a sequence of higher highs and higher lows. Any real further selling in gold really does open the window for a full retest of the uh, of those March April lows, and if we're going and retesting bottoms, then it's not an uptrend. And so the gold is about to give a really big technical tell. I mean, uh, the big question, of course, is is its correlation to real yields. And right now, while we see the long uh, end curve, we'll get to bond markets and yields in a moment. But what's happening is inflation expectations got hammered, and inflation expectations being uh, dropping at a at a pace faster than the yield are moving on the long bond is actually means that the real yields are, are uh, getting really wobbly here, which I think is spooking the gold markets a little bit. But um, whether or not uh, inflation expectations are going to really reverse in a more meaningful way, and more importantly, whether or not that long bond really starts to, uh, to move in a big way, it's going to be uh, the big puzzle piece. I think gold is going to uh, stick with that correlation, and the next big move is going to be a tell on that. Well, Patrick, I think gold and crude oil are almost the same story. Basically, if we're right that the reflation trade is not over yet, then what's happening here is a gift. It's a buying the dip opportunity. And I would say, yeah, of course, you can never call these things exactly, but at 1772, where we are on this chart, uh, I, I think that's probably a pretty good spot to, to think about buying the gold market. If we're right, and this is uh, the knee jerk and nothing more. Now, obviously, if we're wrong and the reflation trade is really dead, I think it's a lot lower than just the recent lows. I think it's like 1400 is, is the next stop. And frankly, I'd welcome that because I'd buy that too. I'd say if there's a trade here right now for me, and I, I'm not planning to put it on, but if I was going to consider putting a trade on, it would be out of the money protective puts to protect my existing long position so that if we do get a really hard break below, let's say, uh, 1675, where the previous lows are, it takes us all the way down to, you know, 1500 or something because everybody's convinced the reflation trade is, is not happening. Or maybe to 1400, I don't know. I'd love to be hedged against that so that I can afford to buy even more to add to my longs when we get there. So that's the trade that appeals to me here if I was going to put one on. All right. Well, we have to wrap up this entire post game by talking bonds because what's interesting here is that it's no longer just a story about the 10-year yield. It's a story about the yield curve and more importantly about whether or not the, the steepener that's been in place for, for a better part of six, seven plus months, whether or not we've entered a bull's a flattening of the curve. And uh, uh, what an interesting reaction we've seen in the uh, bond markets. And so what I put 
put on pages 7, 8, and 9 is the five-year, 10-year, and 30-year U.S. government yields, bond yields. And what we have is you can see that the five-year government yield popped from 70, 75 basis points to close to 90 basis points on the first reaction. The big move in, in yields was in the belly of the curve. And while we saw that five-year move, when we go to the 10-year, we are pretty flat on the, the reaction to the Fed. But if you go to the 30 year, we have yields actually outright breaking down versus where the five year was breaking out. This has really flattened the curve. And this is what actually I think is contributing to, to spooking the markets. So uh, just to kind of show uh, that on pages 10 and 11, I have the 210 spread, which is just starting to roll over. But look on page 11, where we have the 530s. Uh, really, with the, the five-year yield breaking the way it has and the 30s actually breaking down, we have had a complete and total reversal in this and a complete flattening. And this is not just a knee-jerk reaction. This is wiping out literally six months of steepening in two days. And so this is an extraordinary move. And this is actually the one thing that, uh, uh, that we can't take our eyes off of because the entire uh, reflation trade often has the steepening as a key component to it. And if we have a, a flattener kicking in here, what does that mean? I don't, again, I don't want to overread into one, two days of price action, but boy, we can't ignore this. And that's something I want to continue to have the conversation in weeks to come. I'd love to know what our friend Juliet de Klerk is doing here. She trades 530 spreads a lot and uh, has a pretty good track record. We'll have to get her back on sometime and see what she thinks and what's behind this. Patrick, we've looked so far at the yields and we've looked at the spreads in yields. Let's translate that to what you can actually trade, which is the TLT ETF, which of course is 20 plus year uh, average maturity treasury bond fund or ETF. Right. And uh, we had like a month ago, David Rosenberg on the show and, and he actually uh, was uh, calling going into that third quarter that, uh, that bullishness in the, uh, in the long bond. And boy, is this, uh, this Fed uh, hawkishness really put this in play. That treasury bond, you know, during that bond bear market, we saw that, you know, 30 plus dollar wipe out of the TLT during what was just a, a bond bloodbath. And there was no other way to put it. But after several months of basing and now this term, uh, it'll be really interesting to see whether the long bond is going to actually trend higher. And and again, if we see that that you know, you, like we were saying earlier, one day doesn't make a new trend. But if we have a U.S. dollar that starts to trend north of 92, and at the same time, the long bond starts to push higher. Those are red flags and canaries in the coal mine that the reflation trade may begin struggling, and we have to really reevaluate uh, our positions on this. And again, one day doesn't make a new trend, but boy, is this, uh, oh, for the first time in, in months, we have a market that's interesting and some big moves are happening, and, uh, and you can't take your eyes off of it now. I don't know, Patrick. The crude oil market's been pretty interesting for the last few months. <laughs> Well, outside of crude. <laughs> okay. The, 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 the little markets are getting interesting the market, again. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, if you want to be a big picture trader on these big markets, you need to sign up for a free trial of Patrick Service Big Picture Trading, where you can get chart decks like this almost every single day from Patrick. Information is on page 13 of the chart deck. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. Well, today you're going to find the transcript for today's interview as well as a link to Phil's newsletters and the chart book we discussed in the post game. There's also a link to an article titled, Did You Feel the Judder? as the Fed warned rates will rise, as well as a link to a Felder Report article on markets have bought the Fed's transitory narrative hook, line, and sinker. So you'll find this and so much more 
in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That's Eric spelled with a K and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.